Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. I hope you've all had a hearty breakfast, kind of cushion last night's soiree a little bit. Um, my name's Seth Barton. I'm the editor of MCV. Um, I'd just like to thank Philip for having me here this morning to host this. Um, and this morning's topic is rebellion, the path to independence. So um, independence is um, an attractive idea, I think we'd agree. Um, it evokes uh, freedom, uh, creative expression, and uh, keeping the lion's share of what you earn. So um, it's strange that in the games industry, it remains relatively fleeting. The um, game studios often don't last. They become acquired. They, they have to join others to, become, to maintain their viability, um, or, or they simply close down. So um, the, if, if being acquired is the best possible outcome for a game studio, is that the best possible outcome for a game studio? Should more game studios retain their independence, especially at this kind of time where we see Microsoft and others buying up more and more content? So um, this morning, hopefully, we'll get a little bit of insight about that and a bit of insight um, about from our speakers about their background. Um, so to that end, we have two of the UK's most successful independent game makers, two brothers who've worked together for over 25 years, creating titles such as Sniper Elite, Alien vs. Predator, Strange Brigade, and Battlezone. So please put your hands together for Chris and Jason Kingsley of Rebellion. Sure. Yeah, fun. Morning, everyone. Do we sit down? Yep. Yeah. Ooh. Very low this Ooh. seat. Oh, wakes oh, you up, doesn't it? This oh, come around a little. Actually, there are more people here than there were when we first got here. So, yes. thank you for turning up. It's Can everybody hear at the back? Yeah. yeah if you can't, if you can't hear, just keep quiet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks for being here today. Um, so, first things first. So, rebellion. 26 years now? Yeah, 92, yeah. It's 92, it's coming up for 27. 27 yeah. years. Yeah. The trouble uh, with that is it gets so, it's like asking how old you are when you get older, you kind yeah. of have to count back and work yeah. it out. Yeah. And, and it's still completely independent. You guys run, yes. make all the major decisions, and you own the whole business? Yes, yeah, 50-50, Chris and me, shareholders. Yeah. We have no external shareholders. Uh, no VCs behind us, no right. strange shadowy puppet masters pulling the strings, uh, no Illuminati. <laughs> right, it's so an audience, it's not a single. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and that was, a, and has that been, how long has that been a conscious decision for? I mean, did, or was it a conscious decision from the very beginning to. Do you um, was it a con uh, It's always been a thing we've aspired to and wanted to do. Actually, the, I mean, the very first game we ever did as Rebellion, Eye of the Storm was self-published, so, but then we got into, I guess, a very comfortable world of work for hire. But then it takes a while to realize that it's not quite as comfortable as you think it is. Mm. Uh, in, in fact, you know, we, we, were, we did work for hire well before Rebellion, so we had quite a few years of just working as freelancers. Mm. And there's a whole story there of how we got in, uh, how we went from just being individuals and uh, we were working with a sort of a, a, a disparate group of people to then say, look, we need to do something about it and uh, something about the situation and become rebellion. Um, mm. Well, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. So um, in terms of your divide, as, you, as your 50-50, who, who does what generally? Just to... we, we both pretty much cover every aspect of it. Chris is a much better coder than me. I gave up coding uh, on the Commodore PET, so that was some time ago. Uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't really say you started it that much. Well, okay, cool. I could it. peek and poke things. Yes, and you could, don't you yeah, remember? Yeah, my, so I had a, yeah, yeah anyway. Yeah, yeah, L shift O. And yeah. yeah. So I, it was very clear from an early age that I would have to adopt a different position right. as opposed to technology <laughs> focused. Well, art. I mean, art was your, yeah, art your great design, strength. Yeah, art and design, communications, yeah. writing stories, yeah. that kind of stuff. And it was quite complimentary because we yeah. both. You do the same kind of stuff, but you also have a technological background. Yes. Yeah. So it's technology and art. It seemed to actually be you know, a really good sort of thing that fitted together for computer games. Obviously, and Jason was very much into sort of the, the Dungeons and Dragons, Tunnels and Trolls, those sorts of things, mm -hmm. adventure books. He actually wrote one of the kind of the first adventure yeah. books. He wrote quite a lot of yeah. choose your own adventure books. Oh, right. time, yeah. When you were 18, you had a number one bestseller. A number sold one. over a million books. Yep. Steel Iron, the Lost Magic, for anybody that's interested in it, yeah. by Ladybird. 
Uh, I've got the rights back, but not the rights to the artwork. So the path to independence is just write a bestseller at 18. Would you know what? what actually, it here? wasn't paid well, that much yeah. for it. <laughs> actually, you know what? The path to independence is actually wanting to do uh, cool things and make cool games yeah. mm. and try to continue to keep the money flowing in and try to continue to you know, choose your own path, if you like, to, mm. to use the same kind of game, game book method. It's also about recognizing what are the risks. Um, and as a, as, a, as a work for hire developer, yes, there's a comfort level. There's a glass ceiling, though, which is generally down to the, you know, your man month rate. Um, but then there's also there's the publisher risk, which people don't really think about, mm. uh, which is the publisher can cancel your project pretty much for any reason. So in a contract, you'll have a, you'll have, there'll be various cancellation clauses. One of them will probably be a cancellation for whatever reason the publisher wants, because quite frankly, in the past, you'll have found that publishers, if they don't have that clause, they'll make up some kind of thing. Yeah, are we, you, this text just- They'll cancel on you anyway, yes. regardless. Yeah. They'll so, fabricate some yeah. breach that you've done. Yeah, and that yeah. leaves you with a big staff and yeah. no project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Uh, yeah, and they'll probably, you might have like, look, they'll pay you for a month. So, well, that's no good, you've got, a, you've got 50, 100 people working on this project, take you six months to nine months to get the next project. Yes. And actually, if you look at the history of uh, game developers throughout the UK, a lot of the problems they've had is when they've had projects cancelled by a publisher. You know, we've seen uh, friends of ours go, go bust because, well, they just had a project cancelled and just, there's nothing they could do mm. to, to get another project in in time to, to solve the problems. And, the, and they've never had enough kind of spare working capital to keep them going through a, a, a sizable gap like that. I mean, theoretically, you do get, if your game sells incredibly well and you earn back against your royalties and stuff, you can theoretically get more money from the success of the project. But as people will know, that doesn't happen very often because of the way the numbers are calculated. There's incredible echo in here. There is. Is that there we is just have to put up with it? I think, yeah. Okay, it's your booming Fine. voice. All right. Um, I might speak a uh, little more softly. So we had, I mean, we had fantastic success actually. About half of our games when we did work for hire went into extra money. We got extra money for it. Possibly, yeah. yeah. Um, but we've had all sorts of excuses from people that should have been paying us money as to why they haven't paid us money. Right. And one of those was. Well, we don't pay money very often, so we don't really yeah, have we're a, not, we're not, we're not used to paying royalties out. It's like, uh, okay, that's not a particularly good excuse. Yeah. Um, so so from, for, as a work for, work for hire is actually relatively safe, but you are hidden from the risks because you assume your publisher has got tons of money. Mm. Now, the problem with that is that the publisher might not have tons of money, and there's plenty of publishers gone bust. Uh, as well. And so it, it's a bit like hoping somebody else fixes something for you. Yeah. Uh, and not worrying well, about yeah. it. It you're, can you're be comforting. Closing your eyes and yeah. holding your fingers and praying. So, so they're okay. Yeah. Not keen on that model, particularly. <laughs> well, well, well as actually, it was all right. Yeah. Basis, it, was, it, was, it was okay, but it has, it's fraught with yeah. its own problems, mm. which uh, once you leave it behind, mm. you realize those problems are bigger than you thought. Yeah. Uh, and of course, yeah. people, are, it's very hard to bootstrap yourself. It's very mm. hard to get enough money together to afford to make a game from start to finish and get it to the marketplace. Mm. Um, you know, games are iterative, they take time. Whatever you planned at the beginning will probably not be what you end up with if you're doing it right, quite frankly, let alone if you're doing it wrong. Mm. So, so then how did you bootstrap that first game? How did you, or, or when, at what point did you decide that you didn't want to do the work for hire kind of treadmill and you did want to start creating your own games? We, well, shall I? Yeah, go for we, it. We sort of tried to have a portfolio approach. So we, we had some big projects for third parties. We did Simpsons game and various Star Wars games for LucasArts and that kind of stuff. And they paid quite well. Um, but we also tried to, in parallel, develop our own titles. So it's a sort of um, a portfolio approach to risk management, mm -hmm. if you like. So you don't, we were not in a position to suddenly become fully independent. Mm. We sort of had to have this transitional period. We, have to, we had to have this sort of uh, adolescence of uh, independence, right. which took quite a few years to kind of get to the point where we're now 100% funding our own titles. Mm. But there was a time, for example, was it Sniper Elite 3? Yes, yeah, it was a co-development. It was a co-development, so, and that came out of a, an interesting business conundrum. So our partners 505, uh, they wanted to pay, there was a certain amount of money they wanted to pay. Uh, and it was less than the budget needed to be. Uh, we negotiated with them and said, actually, then we'll keep the PC version. They didn't want a PC version. Oh, right. And we were developing on PC. 
So we said, okay, well, we'll keep the PC version and we'll keep uh, digital mm. rights because you, the budget you're paying isn't enough to cover it. And they, they were fine with it because they were largely physical. Mm. And the in, in industry was largely physical there. So it made sense for them, good business choice. It meant that we could scrimp and save and sort of put our bit of the budget into the game. And then, and then we kind of split the proceeds going forwards. Right. And we anticipated the rise of digital, if you like. So we felt yeah. that keeping the digital rights would actually be disproportionately valuable to us going mm. forwards. Because mm. we continued to own the intellectual property and we continued, we felt that the long tail was important. Mm. Uh, and that has been the case. The long yeah. tail of sales has yeah. been a really important so, I mean, component. Kind of the, at core, we always look at, you know, whenever there's some adversity, we always say, well, how can we turn that to our advantage? Right. And that was the situation, look, the budget wasn't what it needed to be. Okay, well, how can we, how can we make that work for mm. them and for us? And that has worked out very well for us. Yes. So you mentioned intellectual property there, which mm. I think is probably going to be one of the kind of core thing, core parts of independence. You can't be independent unless you own your own intellectual properties, really. You can't just work on other people's stuff. So at what point did you start to develop those properties? That, I mean, because I mean, well, right Sniper Elite really is, yes. is your big property. Yeah, but well, right from the very beginning, I mean, either Storm and various other yes. Blade Warrior, we, we right from the very beginning wanted to keep ownership of our, of our own property. Even, even if we sold the rights to a game, we kept the underlying ownership of the property so that we could do a sequel. We were in this for the long term, so I was thinking, well, in 10 years, the platforms would have changed, things would have changed, there'd be a new generation of games players, and if this game is really good, maybe I can make a new version of that game for another generation. Mm -hmm. And the same with the technology as well, so it's our yeah. own engine, and again, part of what we did when we were negotiating with the publishers was saying, look, we own our engine. I mean, the number of contracts that we've seen other people you know, when in those days, they say, well, the publisher owns the engine. It's like, well, you can't reuse that then. How can you do yeah. another game? So we did that, uh, and another area that we negotiated on was to make sure that we owned all the generic assets. Right. Um, and I can't just say, you know, it's like concrete, trees, walls, bricks, you know, those sorts of things, mm -hmm. so, you know, trash cans, that because they're generic, and we could use them across multiple projects. That allowed our publishers at the time to, you know, to save money because they wouldn't have to kind of, we wouldn't have to keep recreating those assets. And you, um, it meant we could use them on other things. So. Yeah. And you've continued to use your own technology. Like yes. Lots of people have moved off to using Unreal or Unity, yep. but you've always maintained your own. And what kind of advantages has that given you? There are many, many advantages. Yeah. Um, principally, we are in total control of what uh, our engine and our technology does. So we don't, you know, we're, we're at the top of the list for getting bugs fixed. We get access to the source code without having to pay extra money. Uh, we get you know, we get bugs fixed when we want them. Mm. Uh, but also, uh, most, of the, most of the people that we speak to, uh, they, they, they use these external engines and they, they're not always very complimentary about them. Because, you know, they'll, for example, they'll have to, oh, there's another, another build of the engine that's come out, another version we've got to then spend two weeks reintegrating. And everything we fix is then broken. This is how, there's a lot of effort. So I actually found this, if you've got your own engine, it's probably just as much effort to maintain it and develop it as it is to be using external engine mm. and it kind of also lets you differentiate your titles yes. and and lets you move into areas like vr because you were quite early yeah. yes we were yes, a launch we were. title yeah. battle zone was a launch title on psvr mm. and i mean other things that we can do it allows us for example you know, strange brigade is was a, a very early vulcan title and in fact it is still the world's only multi-gpu vulcan title in fact i think it's one of the few um direct -X uh, oh. multi-GPU titles as well. So, and, the, yeah, and it's still, it's being used to this day by Kronos and the various other guys to uh, AMD and NVIDIA to, uh, to work up all their drivers for Vulkan. The great thing about that is it gives us direct access to the technology vendors. Mm. Because they, obviously, the, the engine suppliers have their own access, and, and those engines are great. They get you going very quickly if you don't have the infrastructure to have technology. I think you know, I've they, worked out the Every time you turn over there, you get that echo. I think it's picking up that second mic. Maybe, if we, yeah, yeah. Well, if we spread out a little bit, it might help. Okay. How is the echo for you guys? Is it, is it just, it's okay? It's just, it's just us, right. it's annoying. Okay, I'll move over here, sorry. <laughs> we'll, we'll separate a bit. Um, so I think third party engines are, are great to, to get going, to get you up and started. Um, and especially if you don't have technology people in your company to begin with who can do an engine. Um, we kind of started out that way, as most people did back in the day. There weren't third-party engines to hire, so you had to roll your own. Um, and we never stopped doing that. 
and other people have for all sorts of different reasons. Mm. Um, so I don't think we're necessarily down on third-party engines as, as you know, they're, they're not evil or anything, but I think, again, they slightly, they, uh, I, I visualize a snow plow clearing snow in front of you, and, and, and somebody else's engine is, you know, helps you clear the snow, but there's still a ton of snow you've got to get over. Um, and at some stage, there's a big pile, and the snowplow won't go through it. Maybe I've stretched the metaphor too far. Um, but um, uh, they, they, at the end of a project, you've always got that perfecting phase, that polish phase. You know, your frame rate, maybe there's a few places where your frame rate is dumped on. Um, and if it's your own tech, your own team can focus, laser focus on those problems. If it's in the engine, what are you going to do? Mm. Is, sorry, the engine does it that way, and there's not a lot yeah. I can do. But I do think they're also, the engines help people get, get up and running very quickly. Mm. They do have a certain look as well. Mm. Everybody's engine has a certain look. I'm sure our Azura engine has a certain look as far as games players are concerned. Okay, so um, coming back to this idea of developing IP, I mean, you, you own a lot of IP. We own a ton, a shitstorm of IP. <laughs> yeah. well, we, we own, basically, our IP goes back to 1888. Right, yeah, which okay. Which predates computer games industry, which I, is, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is our comic library, in case of you, those of you who don't know. So we, own, we, we bought 2000 AD in the year 2000, which is very convenient for remembering it. Um, we also, we, we then bought a whole bunch of comics from 1970 onwards from Egmont, mm. uh, who we bought 2000 AD Roy from. the Rovers. Roy the Rovers and that A lot of kind of boys' own kind of adventures. Yeah, adventure uh, lots of girls' own. Yeah, there were lots of girls' comics, actually. Uh, we, know, we know when girls' comics stopped being comics. Right. There was a couple of months of history. It's really interesting. Uh, Donny Osmond is to blame, by the way. Ah. We won't go there. Um, <laughs> um, and then we, Time Inc., were having some financial restructuring. And we said, but you've got this whole back catalogue from pre-1970s all the way back to 1888 and Comic Cuts for Boys, which was uh, one of the first boys' funny papers, which is where the word comic, we think, comes from. Right. Yeah, because they used to be called funny papers. They were called funny papers for boys and funny papers for girls. Uh, and so we own all of that. Now, a lot of that's out of copyright, of course, but uh, we've got this, this archive, so we go all the way back there. Things like uh, Billy Bunter and Sexton Blake, Sexton Blake and the Spider and uh, all sorts of interesting characters which predate superheroes, for example. Yeah. Um, but we've always liked telling stories. It's always nice to revisit the place you've, you've created and going back to the earliest days in school when I used to be a dungeon master for my role-playing game buddies, I'd create landscapes for them to explore and Chris did the same. And so really what we're doing in computer games is creating landscapes. If you've got a landscape, there's lots of different ways of exploring it and therefore intellectual property and owning controlling that landscape and how you explore it is a, is a wonderful thing. You know, mm. People like visiting the same place again, but in a different way. Yeah, I mean, the, our IP catalogue was described actually fairly recently as the biggest IP catalogue in the world that you've never heard of. It's a massive catalogue. So I think we will count it. I mean, it's literally miles of shelving. We've got one and three quarter miles of comics. Shelving, yeah. Sh comic shelving. Yeah, and that's not on its side. That's, that's, that that's pages yeah, of comics. And it's, I think we started calculating. I think they got to 55,000 characters and gave up counting. So yeah. It's, it's a lot of IP. Um, Probably I mean, more yeah, even, Disney, although, yeah. I mean, even like the, the more known about like 2000 yeah. AD stuff, I mean, it's not, I mean, it hasn't turned necessarily into games. Well, we wouldn't have been able to buy it if it, if it, if it was... <laughs> Disney scale or Marvel or DC. Yeah. Um, so no. So we've got, we've got quite a hill to climb to kind of yeah. re bring things out. We've we done some to... 2000 AD. Oh no, yeah. 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 But we don't. What well, we didn't want to be known as the guys who do 2000 AD games. Right. So that was uh, quite important yeah. to us. We're we're independent. Create. We're creative people, and we want to do our own independent games. So where it makes sense right. to use an existing intellectual property, mm. great. We'll do that. It's a fantastic place to start. Um, and where it doesn't make sense, we'll create originals like Sniper Elite or Strange Brigade. And it just, that, that's how it works. And to be fair, we've got quite a lot to choose from. So yeah. it's like, well, mm. yeah, why don't you use one of your own IPs? Okay, which of the 55,000 do you mean? We keep getting asked, have you got a list? We no, no, we really don't have a list of them. Not yet. <laughs> um, so I guess that the, the, we've talked about this before, but um, one of the kind of core things about this about rebellion becoming independent is the rise of, of self-publishing mm. um, like at what what point did you start publishing your own titles and 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 how and and at this point how much 
how much of that function is internal and how much of it are you still using partners and other people? Well, well I, I mean, our first, yeah. first game we ever produced, uh, The Storm, was self-published, right. Gunlock. So we've always been trying along the way and, you know, it, I guess it's taken us a few years to get to something that's successful. Um, yeah, so we, yeah, we, we do do it all in-house. Yes. So we've got 350-ish 50 50-ish yeah. people that work in different right. locations. Exactly. Oxford is the headquarters. Uh, we've got Warwick, and we've got Runcorn, and then Wakefield, which we call North. Because mm. um, um, we had an RW. Because we had, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Should have been um, Leamington, but hey. So we, yeah, we, we have all of that function now. We have to, we have to as, we, as you expand the number of games you make and the amount of content you create, you need all those support staff, all of those ancillary skills. Mm. So you need more people in accounting mm. because somebody's got to do the spreadsheets and work out who owes what to whom and that kind of stuff. You need more management, you need more QA. QA is hugely important. QA is an, uh, is an underappreciated aspect, I think, of games development. Good QA can really make a game very good. Audio is hugely important. Audio can make graphics look better. Um, there's all sorts of components that go into making a game. And yes, you need PR marketing, you need community support, customer service. There's a whole bunch of things that you add as you go along. But very much digital was, that was our focus, because when mm. we wanted, when we sort of did our most successful period, you know, recently with self-publishing. Um, we very we looked very hard at do we want to build up a physical publishing di and distribution group, and we th we felt that look, the rise of digital it's probably going to take us five years to get a successful uh, sort of physical publishing group. Do we want to be spending those five years, or do we want to find someone who's great at doing that, mm. get them to do it, whilst we build up and focus on our digital side of things? Yeah. And that's what that's the route that we chose. So sold out of being very very good partners to us. Yeah. For the physical, they know, know they've got a lot of experience, know the physical world very well, and we've been really focusing on the digital. Yeah, so, I mean, so independence doesn't have to mean doing it all yourself. No, you, you no, can't no. do everything yourself. You have to have partners. Mm. Uh, I think one of the biggest learning uh, learnings that we, we have is how much you then have to start spending on PR and marketing and mm. uh, like how much on advertising and marketing. Mm. Yes, you sometimes yeah. get your budgets uh, presented to you for your next game and you go, how fucking much are we spending on advertising? Good God. But you have to. Yeah. Yeah. You've really got to communicate out there. The biggest challenge, I think, these days, uh, apart from making a good game that people want to play, is discovery. Yeah. Apart from the small part of making a Well, yeah, a but assuming, game. assuming we're all competent games developers yes, in this okay. room, you know, we know we have the confidence we can make games, hopefully. Mm. Uh, so let's assume that's a given. But you've actually got to get it out to people, and there are some superb games out there that nobody's ever heard of. Mm. So the challenge, I think, for us is no longer distribution. There was a time when, as an independent developer, you literally couldn't publish your own games. You were yeah. not allowed to. There were physical barriers put in, in, in the way. You, know, you had to have, a, have various publishing slots and all that yeah. kind of stuff and tons and yeah. tons of money. To well, you had to have a cartridge manufactured exactly. and you had to exactly. fight for a it was, slot. It was effectively there. a closed shop, so it was literally impossible. You could sort of self-publish on PC, but that market wasn't very big. Mm. You could publish back in the day on, on cassettes and that kind of stuff. Mm. But then the market shifted to sort of physical in infrastructure and uh, yeah. that kind but of stuff. The number of times we've heard, but you're a developer. And yeah. That's, <laughs> and, that, and, and that's, the, that's the, the reason why you can't do something, but you're a developer. Yeah, I, I, I literally, there's some publishers no longer with us, and I won't mention names because it's embarrassing for them, but they had failed to pay us for something that they owed us. Uh, there's no argument whether they owed us or not, but they just hadn't paid us. So I walked into there after long convoluted conversations with various people, I walked in with a winding up order. And I said, uh, this winding up order, here's a copy of the winding up order, which for those of you who don't know is a thing, you, you go to court to get them to pay the money. They admitted they didn't have any money, which is the thing you can wind somebody up for because right. they don't have the money, so fine, I'll go in and grab what you've got. Uh, went in there and the first thing the chief executive said to me is, you can't do that, you're a developer. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm a business person, you know, you owe me money, you've said you can't pay it, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab your assets first, tomorrow, unless you pay. They paid me, next week, they, the week after they went bust, literally taking everybody else's money with go. them. So Dependent sometimes, sometimes you just have to say, no, we're not, in, uh, we're not the minority partner here, we mm. make games, this is the important underpinning 
mm. of the industry. If we didn't have games makers, there'd be no games industry. There'd be nothing for anybody else to sell. Mm. So we should be, we should be the sort of ascendant ones, if you like. We're the, we're the, 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 mm. We should be the people on top of the pile that everybody else wants to work with yeah. and is scrabbling to work with. Uh, but that wasn't the case back in the day. It's shifted and changed now. Mm. And of course, with dis digital distribution, it is easier to get your game out there. It's not easier to get discovered, though. No. Yeah, it's funny, we're still more comfortable using the D word than the P word to describe ourselves. Yes, it's slightly embarrassing at the moment because we are a publisher, and I don't like being a publisher, really. <laughs> the, the principle is I don't want to be a publisher, but um, we do. We do publish for other people. We do do that. I think that the... the you know, they're, we're all just, they're all just games companies now. Well, they're, they're, they're maybe that division mm, is, yeah. yes, mm. but Content it's very creators. hard after. There are still people in the industry who were in the industry back there, you know. Mm. So. Yes. Um, so in terms of th those extra functions that you have in-house, having the kind of marketing and all the PR, presumably there's a minimum number of titles that you need to be putting out a year in order to keep those people busy? We don't really think about it that way. No, it's not, it's not quite like that anymore. I mean, yes, in, 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 you know, a few years ago, you just put out a game, and then six months later, a year later, you put an, out another game. Mm. It's not that now. It's much more about, okay, your game's coming out. Right, we've got DLC. When's that coming out? You're keeping supporting that. We've got a sale here. We've got that here. We've got this. We've got a, a conference here. We've got a show here. Mm. Um, so it's very much about, you know, it's a long game. Uh, yeah. yeah. If you, just, you think, of, well, I'll just put my game out, and that's it. I mean, you'll do okay, but then you'll have a big gap to the next one. The, yeah. the, the, the trick is, how can you keep your game interested? It's the long so, tail. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got a whole teams of people yeah. who are managing your long tail. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and for those of you who are interested, every game we've ever released follows a power law curve of sales, that, and, and it never gets to zero. Anybody that understands the maths, it never gets to zero. Well, mm. eventually, at infinity, it will get to zero, but it's a long time away. Um, and so yeah. if you can build up that long tail of all your different titles, you've got this um, sedimentary rock yes. piling up slowly, and you're not doing anything, and there's a little bit of money coming in, and then you look back and you go, actually, that little bit of money's turned into a, yeah. you know, a well, modest yeah. amount yeah, of the, money the, now. The games that we're selling from over 20 years ago are still, still, still bringing in money. Wow. For, for us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's why we have to, publish on contracts, <laughs> where you have to make sure you um, have as long as you can on things. And that's one reason why we don't tend to use uh, licensed music on games, because they're often, you know, we've seen uh, quite a few games. Music licensing is a bit of a minefield, so if you, if you embed really cool, trendy music, A, it dates your game very quickly, because that won't be cool, trendy music in five years' time, or 10 years' time, mm. or 20 years' time. Um, and B, you'll have to take it out of the game if you want to keep releasing your game. And there's some big titles out there mm skateboarding titles and that kind of stuff, which had fantastic soundtracks of the era, mm. and they can't be published in that way anymore. Right. So it's something to consider. It's very tempting to license classic, you know, to license great tracks, mm. but it comes with its own problems, not least the cost of yeah. them. Yeah, they're surprisingly expensive. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, I, mean, I guess if we're going to talk about self-publishing, we have to talk about platforms and just how many there are now. Um, I mean, it used to be that... Yeah, but you say that there are lots of them, but actually they're all the same underneath. They're all AMD or NVIDIA graphics. Oh, card, I see, Intel yeah, or, hardware platforms, but also storefronts as well as... Uh, there is that, but that's a, that's a layer on top, really. Back in, the, back in the day when it was hardcore, when all of this was fields, uh, stone engines being built, yeah. um, you know, there were, there were proper differences between the, mm. the, the various different pieces of hardware, you know, proper yeah. Yeah. custom chips, and anybody that's been in it for a long time will, will know when a new piece of custom chip turns up. And we worked on the original Atari Jaguar. Yes. Uh, and that was interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, 64 bit. Mm. First, you, first you, one, wasn't it? Did oh, you yeah. work on the CD expansion that never really... We did have them, yes, yeah. We, we had worked, those, uh, the yeah. Jaguar toilet bowl. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. And we yeah. worked on the VR version, the VR stuff as well. There was a VR game on yeah. that, yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, never came out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, but, so yes, but things technology, are easier to develop so things on now than the Atari easier. Jaguar. Yeah. Well, you have tools now, you have debugging tools. That we're actually in a, arguably a much easier time to make games than mm. ever before, but it's just as hard to sell them. Right. So, you know, 
I think it's a wonderful opportunity mm. out there right now. I mean, the, I mean, in terms of coming, talking about storefronts a bit more, I mean, you've had stuff on Xbox Game Pass. Obviously, you're you know, on all the main stores, Steam, da da da. Yeah. Um, so I do have a little bit of a bone to pick with you. Sure, uh, Because on the cover of MCV's May issue, mm -hmm. uh, Jason was quoted as saying, I would need a bloody good reason to do an Epic exclusive. Um, and then in July, he announced an Epic exclusive. So That's because <laughs> so, he so had a bloody really good reason. Wanted, <laughs> yes, exactly. So what I wanted yeah, um, to know People is, can guess what that bloody good reason was, can't they? It's not, <laughs> it's not exactly yeah. effing rocket yeah. science, you know? <laughs> Um, no, but anyway, we're not politicians, so we can say what we like. Yeah, <laughs> ge genuinely, I think, you know, I would prefer not to do exclusives, but I understand mm, Epic's positioning in it, and quite frankly, they're paying through the nose to mm. build their store. Mm. All credit to them, it's fantastic, and we'll take some of that money, thank mm. you very much. In the long run, though, do you think there's a benefit to you of having more stores? I think competition in any marketplace okay. is, 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 to, is benefiting everybody, mm. including those people who are being competed against. Right. So we, we're good friends with Steam. We know Steam really well, and they're, they're great colleagues and personal friends of ours. Uh, and so, you know, it's a little bit difficult to tell your friend you're going out with somebody else. Um, <laughs> um, but they, 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 took, they took it very well. They're great people. They engaged properly with us, and uh, they understood the reasons behind it because it's a pure business case. And um, I think partly it's also a bit of a kick up the backside for anybody when a new incumbent comes into a marketplace. It makes you reflect. You know, new developers turn up with a brilliant game and you go, bloody hell, that's brilliant. We better have a good look at that and how have they done it? And it makes you focus on your game as well. It's exactly the same for multinationals, yeah. exactly the same for an enormous company. Yeah. Look at Sony, look at Microsoft. They're going head to head and pushing, yeah, we've got the best technology. Nintendo are there, there's massive competition. Mm. And yeah, the times when, when it gets too far out of whack, you know, when PlayStation, uh, sort of two was so successful compared to Xbox. You know, it, it, things you, you could argue well. yeah. Sony sat on their laurels a bit yeah. in that generation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's but for, it's for it's historians. It's a great competition, and it's mm. great to see that it helps everyone. Mm. But I have to say, it was a little bit of an embarrassing interview to give, and then one month later <laughs> to, to then have the opposite. Yeah. Ironically, it, we had been talking with them in the background, but it kind of kicked things off a bit faster. They went, oh. I, I was aware. Ironically, I, I was so, actually yeah. I was I was aware that Epic were doing exclusives, obviously, because mm. that was the question. But we hadn't actually been offered yes. anything at the time. Yeah. Uh, I, it would have been, uh, and I didn't really think they would, because typically they were going for the sort of super big, big big titles, which is mm. great because they obviously count our new title, Zombie Army Four, as a as a big title, which is which is great. It's a really nice bonus for us. Um, uh, and I was. Yeah, I was quite impressed by the numbers that they, <laughs> that they offered. And I, have to, I, have to, I have to say, working with them, they're yes. really, really you know, like the Steam guys, they're a really nice bunch of guys. Mm. Uh, what's great about both Steam uh, guys and Epic is they're ex-developers. It actually really makes quite a big difference to how they perceive you, how mm. they work with you. It's really, we see eye to eye rather than like, hey, we're up here and you're yeah. down there. They're never going to turn around and go, but you're a developer. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And also Epic were very uh, keen to support, help support the game, uh, you know, give it a lot more marketing than we might have expected. So that's to everybody's right. benefit, really. So I mean, so it was, you know, it was fantastic. the, the it was store really isn't good. inundated yet, so presumably you'll get a lot of space on the front of exactly. the, on, exactly. on the front yeah, page. Yeah, we get a lot of, yeah, and we get support from Steam as well. It was just that Epic offered a, a, a very attractive package. Mm. Uh, and that as an independent, again, you sometimes as an independent developer, you've got to take your chances. You know, when something like that is offered, when you have the opportunity, mm. like we did with Sniper Elite 3, to sort of share in the risk and the share in the reward, that was part way towards full independence. Mm -hmm. And uh, deals like Epic, Epic offered don't come along that often, mm. uh, and therefore you have to sort of search your bank account and work out whether you want to do it or not. Oh, did I say, no, Seoul, I meant Seoul, not bank account. <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually genuinely did agonise about it. We did, yeah. yeah. We genuinely did. Absolutely. We, we, you know, it's a, should we do this? Should we not do this? You know, we've got a great relationship with Steam. We really like the Steam guys. Um, I mean, really you know, and obviously there's a player base for the game on, on Steam. So, that, I mean, that's the main agonising that has to be done. No, no, it wasn't, that it wasn't the main agonising. It, it was an element of it. Mm. Right. Generally, it was, the, you know, the Steam guys, we really like them. They're great guys. We like we working really with them. them. We so like them. working with them. Will this upset them or not? That was the biggest, yeah. the biggest issue, was how, 
how much impact, negative impact, is going to have on our friends at Steam. Mm. Um, this, is, this is the joy of independence. This is freedom, isn't it? This is, this is the freedom. This is where you have the responsibility. Yeah, where the responsibility is. But there are big developers out there that have had this done to them mm. by their publisher without yeah. even knowing. And that's even worse because they can't sit here and go, well, they can sit here and go, it wasn't my fault. Mm. Uh, we have to take the blame for that decision. Or but if they're allowed to talk or, about or it. Or if, yeah, yeah they probably yeah. wouldn't even be allowed to, yeah, yeah. true. Yeah. We've been told to don't talk to the press many mm. times in the past <laughs> on games. So, I mean, I guess that, that, that independence on a daily basis means that you can make decisions quickly, that, you know, that you're not, you, that you, you don't have to double think about what something, someone else might yeah. think. And, and that must extend to creativity and business decisions and all all kinds of things. Well, it, as, a, as a big is there a, I don't know what's the word, a kind of a, an, an overall outlook of just kind of like, well, we're independent, so we can, we can make a decision and get something done and push on. No, not really. It's an absence of, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a certain lack of formality within the company. People mm. that have joined yeah. the company from big corporate entities are sometimes surprised by their informality. Um, somebody sitting in there when he's in his first day, day, first few weeks, put together a 42-page uh, presentation about PowerPoint something, deck, yeah. uh, a PowerPoint that he wanted to do. And apparently we rather disrupted him by saying, can you just flick to the last couple of slides, please? And what's the summary? Yes, that'll do. And he went, oh, <laughs> you, you learned, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, because at the end of the day, we've only got that one of our biggest limited resources is time. Mm. And as you get bigger, you do have to have formality. You know, you've got formal accounts to put in every year, you've got tax to pay, R&D tax credits and games tax credits to claim, and all that kind of structure that goes with it. You've got HR issues and an HR department. So naturally, there's more formality as you get bigger. But that formality should be there to underpin the company and, and help support the proper functioning of it. Mm. But I don't have to go in dress in a suit and tie and present to uh, glassy-eyed board members who don't give a mm. stuff what, we're actually, what the games are. They care about the bottom line. We care about the bottom line, but it's not the only thing we care about. Mm. Uh, in fact, it's probably not the most important thing. As long as you've got enough money coming in to do the next game, that's what's most important. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of corporate admin that's missing that we don't have to spend money on and time on because we don't have anybody else mm to blame. Yeah, but it's also about empowering the team members. And we'll, you know, we're not there looking at the games every single hour, every single day, but we'll come in, we'll do reviews, and we'll have suggestions and improvements, and we'll, you know, things will get improved. Uh, but it is very much, you know, this, is, this is what the game is. You know, here's a one or two page. Let's get on and do it. The teams work on those features, decide on them. We all agree where we're going. And occasionally, oh, here's a, this would be a nice thing to have. We, we sort of nudge, don't we? Yes, we have yes. this sort of role. I always think of our role as nudging the games in the, in the right direction. We initiate them, and then we nudge the team and, and kind of challenge and you know, ask the awkward, slightly awkward questions. Is this bit fun? Mm. I know it's in the design, but is it actually fun to play? And those kind of things, and, and, and ask the teams to rise to the challenge. And that's really what our role as company directors is, is empowering our staff and our teams to, to make the best games they can. Mm. Sometimes challenging time frames, sometimes you know, restrict, you know, we don't have the biggest budgets in the world. Our games are not, don't cost 100 million to make, not even close. Um, but there's still a substantial number of millions quite often. Mm. So there's a lot of money goes into it, but not as much as some. So, uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so, and, and what's the head count now? Three, three, just 50 ish. 350 ish? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and it's consistently, you've, you've managed to keep a kind of consistent growth? Well, that's not really the objective. The, um, the objective is to take on uh, the, exactly the right number of people with the right skills you need to do any, one, any projects you've got going at the time, mm -hmm. which, of course, as anybody that manages a company will know, is next to impossible. Mm -hmm. So then you've got to manage the start the headcount. What we don't do is hire and fire as we need. That's projects. what I was trying to, yeah. We, we, ref, we just, just don't do that. That's just wrong. Um, we will hire, we do hire and fire. You know, we, we sometimes fire people, not fire people. Sometimes people leave the organization um, <laughs> because you know, they haven't fitted in or they haven't done the work properly or so, but it's very rare. Or the next opportunity. Or, they, or, or they want to go and live in America or Canada or something, and that's fine. Yeah. It, and and all, a company is like a living organism, there's inputs and outputs, but the, the, whole, the company marches on. Um, but we don't hire a bunch of people, make the game, and then 
get into that awkward situation of needing to make this quarter's financials yeah. work for the shareholders and have to fire a bunch of people. Yeah. And then, by the way, hire them back next quarter. Yeah. Uh, uh, which the public, you know, the public doesn't know, and the shareholders don't notice, and you know that creates instability. So we don't really, we don't, we, we, we don't do that. Mm. Do you, I mean, how do you maintain that stability, though? It's just a matter of planning ahead and making sure that all the projects are lining up. Because do you use outsourcing yeah. to help? We do use with some outsourcing yeah, on, on, on art, um, and that helps. That, re that really helps with kind of the, you know, the, when you need a lot of bulk art, but we very much focus on a lot. These, this is the key art, so we're con our, our teams are concentrating on the, the, the best pieces, the most exciting mm. pieces. The hero, the hero, hero. bits, and that yeah. kind of stuff. And then, you know, the, the, the filler stuff that mm. tends to go out to our Yeah, if we, need, if we need 50 different street lights, for example, right. you know, we might design five of them in-house, and then concept, the co in-house concept will design the rest of them, and then that one might go to outsource to do the bulk work. Yeah, it means yeah. I guys can concentrate on, say, the cool stuff. It's yes, the most yes, fun yes. stuff. But it is, it's, an, it's a never-ending sliding block puzzle mm. of working on projects simultaneously. And uh, I think possibly one of the best policies we have, and it's an unofficial policy, is sort of N minus one. There's always, there's not, never quite enough people to do it, which means that everybody's working, you know, everybody's not, not stressed, but everybody's got things they've got to do because there's not having anything to do is actually really bad for morale. Yeah. Having too much to do is bad for morale as well. Yes. But not having much to do till next yeah. week is actually quite draining. If, ever, if there's and a little fun. bit more than the, the amount you need, it yeah. also makes everyone's job slightly more secure, yeah. doesn't it? Because yes. yeah. they're not like Exactly right. Back. And you'll know as a journalist here, yeah, having a deadline does focus the mind. Oh, yes. <laughs> it yeah. does indeed. <laughs> Yeah, and also, I still make magazines, yeah. so we have real deadlines, yeah. not those kind of, hey, you, maybe we could put it up online tomorrow. Yeah, you know, exactly. Hey. Yeah. So do we, weekly. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, 2000 weekly. 2000 AD is weekly. Yeah, yeah. since so we, 1977. Yeah, That's so nice. we share that. Yeah. Yeah, I must How's get that for subscription pressure? running. <laughs> yeah, well, you can do it digitally if you want to. Uh -huh. Yeah, 2000 AD online. Save the trees. Yeah. The, um, so, I mean, although you've re remained independent, recently you've acquired a number of other studios and yes. brought them, brought them into to, to your... <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. But we don't, don't, we, go, don't ask them questions, yeah. really, and we'll never get a word in. <laughs> yeah. we, we don't have a, we haven't gone out to look for people to acquire. Right. We've never done that. Uh, Opportunities have come up in conversations and situations have been such that there's an opportunity to acquire somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they're a good fit, if we work them before, if they're friends, if it makes sense for us financially, then, you know, uh, then why not? Mm. You know? so and if there's an emergent component. If you, you know, hiring individual people, they've got to take time to get up to speed. They might not gel with individuals or gel quickly with individuals but when you if you acquire a team of people that work together there's a sort of an emergent property there that's sort of quite valuable mm. you know they've worked together assuming they're good at what they do mm. which they must be um, there's, there's, there's an added value it's really hard to put it into actually you know, pounds shillings and pence I've got to show my age um, kind of a culture yeah and if that culture yes, exactly. works with rebellion's culture yes. then you can bring them on board exactly much right. easier than you can bring on board 13 individuals and hope yes. that they all stick yeah well hopefully those 13 people are greater than hiring 13 random mm. people who are good at their job mm. okay so I mean like in a way we're talking about independence and retaining independence, mm. but on the other hand, obviously for some people, being acquired is actually the best step forward but to maintain their stability and the viability of the studio. Yeah, we're, like we're, we're, I, I think so. Well, we're probably not the people to ask about. They should ask some of the people we've acquired and whether <laughs> they think it's a good thing or not. Uh, hopefully, they'll all say, yes, it's a good thing. Um, it's kept their job stable. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. So that's the thing, you know, jobs are, jobs and stability, I think, is really important for mm. people, and they can get on with the rest of their lives mm. without having to worry about are they going to make their mortgage payment or be able to... Yeah, I mean, you know, another, another factor, you know, for people that own companies is, you know, there's a lot of stress on people. They're going, where are we going to get the next project? You know, they've got their finances, they've got to think, where, you know, we've got to pay these people, when's the next milestone coming? There's a lot of pressure, mm. and it's quite attractive for, for some people to say, look, can I hand those problems over to someone else? Or can I just make games? Because most people, like us who, who founded companies, went into making games, set up their companies to make games. Mm -hmm. And there's 
there's all this other crap they have to deal with just to make games. Mm. And we've accepted that yeah, we can't make games in the same way that we used to. Mm. So yeah, our roles have metamorphosized so much from the old days. Yeah, Jason doesn't do art anymore. I don't do programming any, anymore. So probably people are probably quite great. I think I used to, I was quite good at D-Paint back you in the You were very day. good at D-Paint, yeah. yeah. You did some really good 3D stuff on yeah. graph paper before there were any uh, applications. I remember typing, I remember before there were tools to make things. Anyway, shouldn't, shouldn't reminisce too much, but I do remember typing in yeah. uh, matrices for... Yeah, yeah, for yeah. We did some, re some really interesting characters in full 3D, you know, like you know, using 20 or polygons and animating them to make them look really interesting. So, yeah, he's a very talented artist, actually. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maybe, maybe one day you'll return <laughs> to it. And well, yeah, I, there are much better people that work for me now. <laughs> the, um, so I guess my main worry today is that, is that I'm going to say to you, so you wouldn't sell mm -hmm. your company. And oh, don't ask him. He'll, he'll I'll just say I'll have a bloody good reason, oh, Exactly, yeah. and you're going to tell me a bloody <laughs> yeah. good reason. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll be sitting here, you know, in two months' time, you'll be owned by Microsoft, and, and you won't be able to say, and I won't be able to interview you anymore, exactly. which would be a, a yeah. huge loss for, for me. We, we've been approached many times by people to be acquired and it's never worked out for us. Mm. I've never felt it was a good thing for staff or for the company or for what we wanted to do. Mm. Uh, the, one of the reasons I always, I, I never say never in interviews is because you never know. But, yeah. and I don't really like lying, if somebody says, would you ever sell? I was like, well, I suppose, yes, I can imagine absurd scenarios where where we might, mm. but those scenarios are so absurd, and I'm a creative, so I can come up with really absurd ideas. Um, then you know, I don't like basically no. We're not. We're not. Unlike some companies, we're not going out to be acquired. We don't have investors, VCs, whose job is to mm. you know, build up a company and then sell it for a profit. So yeah. that's 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 the difference. Is we don't have someone behind us who says, look, get big get sold. Mm. And you haven't floated the company either. So. I think it'd be very unlikely we'd want to float because I think that's just a lot of hassle. We've got colleagues who have floated and uh, they tell me that my job as CEO would change entirely from making, running the company and making games to managing investors. Right. And going to board meetings in, with glassy-eyed investors. And I, I don't like the idea of doing that. I wouldn't want to do that necessarily but never say never yeah and, and and on the never say never if someone came to you a couple of years ago and said you were going to open a tv studio mm -hmm. and put a feature film into production yep. then w was that w was that in your mind yes or? and part of what we do is our job is to think many years in advance to think multi-steps mm. so and i think that's again that's the sign of of good uh, good management good owners of a company good good developers is how far ahead can you think Mm. You know, so for those that don't know, they'd have now a TV studio. And well, we wanted to, we, we played around, we've, we've worked with, we co-produced, we co-produced the, the Dread movie that DNA did, but we didn't have that much. We had quite a lot to do with it, but not as much as I would have liked. Mm. Uh, and they, the, whilst it was a great movie, they did things that, that I wasn't, I would have done slightly differently. It is a good um, movie, though. Oh, it's a fantastic movie, absolutely brilliant. I, I, yeah. I, you know, I know we everybody. worked hard to make the script right. Yeah, there's a few lines in there that's like, I wrote that, that's cool. Um, <laughs> but uh, th that, the point is, what's the, if you've got a box of toys to play with, what's the point handing the box of toys over to somebody else to play with? Because you want to play with your own toys. So uh, that's, that's really what we always wanted to do. And then so we started to commission scripts and develop things uh, by developer, the industry is different. The, the, the film and telly industry talks about development being the thing you do before production. Mm -hmm. You always have to swap heads, really, when you're talking about different industries. Um, so we're developing scripts and things for film and TV, uh, and we're actually investing. So we've got our first uh, fully funded feature film, Schools Out Forever, based on one of our Abaddon books, uh, going into production. Is it three weeks from now? Two weeks. Yeah, two, two weeks. weeks yeah. Two weeks ish. Yeah. Uh, actually, physical. And that goes into production. production at your own studio space. Uh, yes, partly the studios, partly on location in London, and partly on location in Ipswich. It's right. about uh, uh, the apocalypse in a boys' public school. Right. So, which are not too. Which far are apart, actually really. broadly it's the same, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that's exciting. Uh, one of the challenges was, though, there's, there's a, a lot of development, uh, sorry, a lot of uh, filming going on in, uh, in the UK at the moment, and there just isn't enough space. I think the government said there's, there's a shortage of two million square feet 
uh, right. studio space. And we were looking around, and one of the things, we want to be materially involved. We're going to have to bring in professionals to help us with production and stuff. Um, but we wanted to be able to be there all the time when they're being made, because that's fun, and mm. that's really what we do it for. Uh, and it wanted, wanted to be close, and there wasn't anywhere available. Pinewood's booked up, Shepherd is now booked up fully for 10 years. Oh, is that the Netflix deal? Yeah, yeah. Netflix basically bought yeah, Shepherd for, yeah. for 10 years. Pinewood's, basically, Pinewood are full when they're at 87, 85 to 87% capacity, so their paperwork says. They're wow. at 96% capacity now, so they basically have no wiggle room for anything. We just couldn't find any space to do anything at any reasonable price. There was a few places, there was some place in Cardiff, but Cardiff's a beautiful place, but it's a damn long drive from Oxford. So I didn't want to do that. So we looked and we found a place. So we decided to do the rebellious thing and actually find a place that we could convert into studios. So we've got a 12 acre site, 250,000 square foot of studios, uh, one of which is a, there's a massive soundproof envelope that was built around a newspaper print works. And the, Printworks itself has gone, come out entirely, and there's an enormous set of chambers there, which are all soundproofed, right. which is exactly what you need for a studio. So we've got a ready-made studio there. So we acquired that. That's, um, we've merged, that's our second set of studios, along with Audio Motions, Wheatley Studios. Mm. And uh, After many years, I've been to your offices of kind of saying, well, you know, there's a bit of space out the back, but really, we're, we're at capacity in this office. We have, we have built. And there's a lot of people in those 2000 AD at the back, and there's development teams, and QA, and yeah. marketing, and there's your guys' offices, and, and you know, and, and it's all in this one big space, really. Yeah. And now you've like, oh, well, we've got four football fields worth of extra space Correct. over there. Correct, more than four, yeah. Well, we've just, there was a big warehouse at the back of our Oxford studio, which we have just converted to offices. We've got oh, two more spaces out of the back, which we haven't that, seen yet. Yeah. We haven't, it's not open yet, but it's, yeah, we've expanded oh. into that studio, into that warehouse. Waiting for the sign-off from building control. Yeah, I remember when we first moved into the Oxford studios, it was uh, quite a big space, and I remember putting my arm out and thinking, all right, people are so small that I can cover them with my thumb, so that's, yeah. uh, that's, yeah. that's We're joking about having binoculars or telescopes to, to look out of our offices of people. Um, it's big open we space. We never did. It's they big thought, open oh, space. could do drones, mm, fly yeah. along and just check people, and fly back. But the idea was to have a big open space which could be flexible. If we need a small team, we can have people work together. If it's a big team, we can have a big team working together and we move people around. It's communication. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah, you could just walk past and see what someone's doing, you know, the little huddles, you know, and you're not getting this go for popping up, having a look around and popping down. Yeah. With the, I think it's really important cubicles. for coders, artists, designers, QA to all work together because sure, they're all in the nice. same team. They're all making, they all should be pulling in the same direction, trying to make the best game possible. And silos prevent that kind of communication. So an open plan office works really well, has worked yeah, really well. You get those communications, so you get the, the, the idea is to kind of have the leads in the middle so code and art and, stuff, and then just filtering out so everyone, you've got multiple connections. To concentric possibly. rings around right. the, the key coordinating people of the project. But the studios are interesting because we've got, so we've got Rogue Trooper is very likely to start filming there in the new year. That's with Duncan Jones. So we've got the script for that, which is looking great. Uh, very exciting that. And there's a couple of other projects as well, which hopefully should go in there next year now, isn't it? Yeah, next year, mm. 2020. Yeah, thinking ahead, looking ahead yeah. for several years. Uh, how does that then fit in with the games? I mean, is, what, where, I mean, apart from the IPs, is there synergy with the with the current games? But you know what? There's quite a lot of VFX synergy. There's a right. lot of yeah. a lot of uh, parallel, you know, uh, yeah. kind of components and artwork yeah. and everything is, yeah. is very similar. Mm. Eighty percent of VFX is done broadly the same way we do it for computer games. It's just they're not real time, mm. and they could spend longer per frame, and they could put yeah. more fidelity per frame. It's in. broadly the same tools. You know, yeah, to brush those sorts of things. So there's definitely yeah. that. Um, production skills are transferable as well. Uh, there's a possibility. I, I mean, again, we're not going to just we're not going to make movies and telly of our games mm -hmm. or of our books. We'll be doing originals as well. Right. So the idea is to tell good stories and entertain people. And content is the only thing that really matters in the creative industries. You know, it yeah. doesn't matter. I, I liken it sometimes to making a phone call. You know, if I make a phone call to somebody, I just want to speak to them. I don't actually care who's carried the data mm -hmm. or who's earned what it's fraction of a penny or whether it's been routed <laughs> via the Maldives or anything, or as long as the signal's good. Yeah. I don't actually give a yeah. stuff. Those are enormous multinational companies there, but they're all taking fractions of a penny off me, and I pay monthly, so I don't even know how much it's cost. I don't, mm. and, stop looking at how much my phone calls cost there, these days. There are two fixed points. There are people who make the games, the movies, the TV, and there are people who watch them. Mm. And we don't really mind how 
or care how people get, get them. We want them just to get the cool stuff yeah. that we make. I can see a situation, for example, when I've got my mobile screen, it might even not be a, mo might be a phone, it's a communication device of some description, I say, I haven't watched the original Star Wars movie in ages, so can I watch it please? And my personal assistant goes, sure, and it starts showing the original Star Wars for me. I haven't got a clue who, who I've paid. Who you've paid. Yeah, or, I, or nor do I give a shit, quite frankly. I want to watch Star Wars. Yeah. And I may have paid 10 quid, 5 quid, 7p, whatever, I don't know. Yeah. And somebody will have served well, I've got that to me. Netflix, Amazon, yeah. Disney, yeah. Hulu. Yeah. And so arguably, things like Netflix, Netflix is a big, important company, of course, at the moment, but they've got to build up a, a back catalog. They've got to build up a value, which is in their content. And that's why they're commissioning so much fantastic stuff. Because mm. what matters, people watch Netflix because of the content. Yeah. You know? Yeah. A bit different for people like Amazon. You know, mm. Amazon can sell you toilet rolls and content. So they've yeah. got something else to sell you. Eventually, so they've got a different all business those model. silos and all those delivery platforms and brands become less important. It just becomes, you think, eventually Yeah, it's the it content that they own that's hugely either. important. Yeah, really. Okay. Um, have you answered think, questions? Well, I've got to the end. No, it, okay. says, it says conclude here. Yeah. So um, we, we are also running short of time. Um, are there maybe any, are there any questions? someone else might have yeah. some questions. Exactly. Um, any questions? Oh, there we go. Straight in. Well, he used front. to work for us. Is there someone who didn't work for us <laughs> that we could actually ask a question? <laughs> go on, quickly, Matt. Go on then, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a lot of the world has kind of turned towards this games as a service. You guys are obviously doing free new things. Uh, we see a lot of big new companies that are doing games as a service. Uh, which means they're basically be on that same product for a very, very long time. But a lot of the value you talked about for yourselves is the portfolio. Just you've got this huge range of different things that you can do with the game. Do you think that new companies coming out now will there ever be rebellion in 25 years in the same place that you are now with that, that portfolio that you're on? That's a tricky one, isn't it? I, the the, the long-duration games, games as a service, is a... Uh, it's fraught with some difficulties at the moment. You know, there's all the controversy around loot boxes, there's controversy around free to play. I think these are conversations that we have to have as an industry and quite frankly, the general public has to work out what they're okay with and what they're not okay with. Um, it all comes down to spiraling budgets for the biggest projects. You know, if you're, if you, it's costing you $150 million to make a project and you, you know, the, the traditional market is only gonna bring you 60 million in, well, you've gotta find a way of squeezing more money out because you've got shareholders who want to see endless growth. It comes back to this whole thing of not having shareholders and not having to do endless growth. So there, I think there's some challenges there. The other issue for me is um, how much do those projects cannibalize each other? So if you're somebody like EA and you've got, you need to make lots of projects, but you want those projects to last for four or five years, you're putting lots of money into project one, now project two is launched, and you want that to last for four or five years. Is that, are you marketing that to the same people that you actually want to stay in project one and project two? I think there's a lot of complexity there for them to get their heads around. I mean, for us, we, we typically, we want to extend the lifetime of our projects in this long tail, but we would, uh, we're looking at doing that with loot, with not, not with loot boxes, but with things like DLC and, you know, elements that, that makes sense, you know, buy this additional adventure, this additional level for whatever number of quids it is. So it's a sort of clear and obvious transaction for somebody. Um, yeah, we, we dabbled in the free-to-play space a little bit, didn't we? We had a couple of free-to-play yeah. titles and learned quite a lot about it. Well, the trouble with the free-to-play at the moment is it's down to the guys with the biggest acquisition budgets. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you look at companies, oh, they've done two billion turnover. Yeah, but they, did, but they spent 1.8 billion on user acquisition, or as we used to call it, advertising. So <laughs> their, their, their margins are very thin. So those, sometimes you could imagine those are quite brittle business models. Mm. It doesn't take much. As anybody that works in leverage derivatives knows, you can make a lot of money, but you can lose a lot of money very quickly. And if your business model is quite brittle, like, if you're a developer and you've got one project for one publisher, and that publisher finishes the project. That's a brittle business model. If you've got two projects for two different publishers, there's less brittle that's there. So if one fails, you've still got the other to fall back on. And, and some business models in free to play are quite brittle. You can imagine it doesn't take much for the delta to change before you know, making yeah. 200 million becomes losing 200 million a year. Any more questions? I think there's some hands up. But... There we go. People at the back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Run microphone, man. Yeah, back there. Yeah, back there. Stick your hand up. Oh, yeah. oh, there he is. Hi, guys. Thanks for the talk. 
And um, I've been seeing a lot of talk about the transition and merger between video games and the movie industry. So things like Bandersnatch, where there's a blur of the marks. It seems like you guys are now ideally suited to experiment in that area. Do you think you will in the future? Uh, experimenting with interactive movies has been done for decades um, and failed every single time. Uh, personally, I don't know. I think something might happen there. I think VR is an interesting area for movie, entertainment, sort of more movie-like experiences to overlap into games. I think it's a bit like saying, can you merge books and games? Yes, you can. They're called game books and choose your own adventure and all that kind of stuff. Not a big part of the industry, but a functional part of it. I think that games and movies do something different. Games and television do different things. They entertain in a different way. Um, one is much more active and one is much more passive. And if anybody, people near here know about Venn diagrams, you know, the idea of smushing the two together is you get every audience, but you might actually only get the overlap, which is, which, which is not and good. The, and there's certainly been times in the past where we've had the film industry come in and say, hey, we're going to show you games, guys, how we make the games. Oh, yeah, we've had that. Do you remember the Cyber, Cyber Awards? What was it in Hollywood? Cybermania. Or was we Cybermania Cyber Awards, Mania, the yeah. first attempt yeah. by Hollywood to capture the video games industry. Yes. It was black tie events. They had proper seat fillers. You know, yeah. Somebody leaves to go to the loo, somebody sits in there. And the culmination was best actor in a yeah. video game. Best actor and actress in a video game. They'd had a presentation on how video games are made. And it's it, a five-step uh, process. Five step process. Step one, write the script. Yeah. Step two... I can't remember half of them, but the last step, step was the, add the interactivity. Add the, add the game. The, the step five in making a computer game was make the game. I think it was write the script, cast the actors, film the actor's performance, edit the actor's performance, and then add the computer game at the end. <laughs> it was absolutely awesome. We were sitting there in our rented tuxedos as probably the only people actually in the games industry in the whole of the uh, place. It was genius. Uh, just absolutely. It was astonishing, proper Hollywood nonsense. Brilliant. And it was Caesar's World of Boxing on yeah. Philips CDI that won, won the one best game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. CDI. It was great. It was like that. It was like, what? Nobody played that. So, no, he'd need a bloody good reason to make a crossover video game. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, I, I really don't think those two areas cross over very well, I have to say. I think they're intriguing, and I think they could do, but I, I just, yeah, I think it's very, very difficult and very expensive to do well. Let's face it, it's really expensive to make a linear uh, television program, really expensive to make a linear film, and that's with one ending. Um, you make one with six endings, where you're obviously going to be increasing your production quality or spreading your production money more thinly over those six endings. And the trouble with having six endings is, are most people going to watch all six, or are most people going to watch one and go, kind of, that was curious, okay, fine, I'm done now, I'll go on to the next thing. So you're wasting all of that production value. So I think there are lots of tensions and difficulties in that area. Yes, we are ideally placed for it, though. Uh, and virtual production, for example, is an area that Audio Motion are, are, are building up, one of our divisions, doing a lot of work in the virtual production space. So that's sort of using games technology to do pre-vis and post-vis for movies and production in general. So uh, the, the overlap might not be where you think it is in terms of the end product. It might be more in the production process. Cool. Anyone else? Oh, just back there. Oh, are we out of time? Yeah. Oh, God, we're out of time. Sorry. 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 Ask us afterwards. Okay. Yeah, if you can well, find us, we're off. Um, <laughs> that was rather abrupt. Yeah. That was. I don't we, like we, this we, being. <laughs> there are other <laughs> sessions. Yeah. But at least it wasn't that. Okay. To go to, okay. At least it wasn't so. that. <laughs> um, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope you all. I'm going to ask you to clap, but yeah, there, brilliant, thank, thank you. you very much, cheers. <laughs>